This session is to discuss the master's degree program in the Department of Biomedical Engineering offered through the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Ayana Teal and I am the Assistant Director of Recruitment and Marketing for the Whiting School of Engineering. We will begin this session with a brief overview of Johns Hopkins Engineering. To give you an opportunity to get answers to your questions, we will have Program Director Dr. Raymond Winslow join us. Ray Winslow, the Johns Hopkins Raj and Neera Singh Professor of Biomedical Engineering, coined the phrase and is recognized as the founder of the new field of computational medicine. As founding director of the Institute for Computational Medicine at Johns Hopkins, the first and largest research institute of its kind, Winslow leads a collaborative team of engineers, mathematicians, computational scientists, and biomedical researchers from the Johns Hopkins Schools of Medicine and Engineering. Ray also serves as the director of the Center for Cardiovascular Bioinformatics and Modeling. Today, we will discuss engineering at Hopkins, an overview of the master's program, the admissions process, including some important dates, specific research areas, graduate student life, and finally, a live question and answer session. Johns Hopkins University was the nation's first research university founded for the express purpose of putting discovery and knowledge to work for the good of humanity. Today, we are a top tier university and remain committed to academic excellence and pioneering research. For the past 38 years, Hopkins has led the U.S. higher education in research and development, spending a record $2.43 billion in fiscal 16, and that amount increases every year. The Whiting School of Engineering is home to 11 graduate programs and more than 25 research centers and institutes. Because our research is interdisciplinary, our faculty works closely with the eight other divisions, including the School of Medicine, Applied Physics Laboratory, and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our expertise includes medicine and engineering, defense, information engineering, and resilient systems. It is the mission of the Whiting School to provide its students with an outstanding engineering education that is innovative, rigorous, and relevant and prepares its graduates to be 21st century leaders. Some of the career resources available to our students include the Life Design Lab, where there are counselors specifically dedicated to graduate students, employer and alumni networking events, and resources for entrepreneurship. As I mentioned earlier, we have on the line with us the director of the program, Raymond Winslow. Ray, would you like to now go over the program overview? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm happy to talk to you about the Biomedical Engineering Master's program. We have a large program. Um, our goal in the Department of Biomedical Engineering is to engineer the future of medicine. I believe that medicine is becoming an engineering discipline and biomedical engineering is leading the way in making it an engineering discipline. We're a large department. We have 67 faculty, almost 500 undergraduate students, almost 130 master's students, and over 200 PhD students and many postdocs. We have extensive collaborations with premier institutions all over the country and all over the world. And one of the most distinct things about Johns Hopkins University is the seamless way in which faculty can collaborate across schools and departments and organizations. And so um, it is very easy for um, faculty and students in the School of Engineering to connect with faculty in the School of Medicine, to connect with faculty in the Bloomberg School of Public Health, um, um, to, to, and to set up new research collaborations. There are two pathways through our master's program. In option one, um, which is a course-based degree, uh, it takes uh, roughly one year to complete uh, coursework, which tallies 30 credits of approved coursework, typically about two focus area core courses, three or more focus area electives, and then a set of additional electives uh, comprise each of our focus areas. Option two uh, also involves a year one of coursework, 
But in addition, in year two and the summer before year two, um, students begin work and ultimately complete a research thesis and write a, um, uh, a, th a thesis uh, based on that work. And every student, regardless of whether they're doing a one-year course option or two-year thesis option, uh, elects from one of a number of different focus areas at the time of application. We have a second program uh, which is separate uh, and distinct from what I've just described, and it's the Chinua JHU dual degree program. It's a master's degree program uh, that is done in conjunction with Chinua University in China. Um, in this program, all students uh, uh, complete one year of coursework at Johns Hopkins University, that's in year one, and upon completion of that coursework at the end of May, all students go to Chinua University and in year two complete uh, thesis research and write their thesis. Um, now, the units involved at Chinua University are the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, which is one of the premier ECE departments in the world, and the Department of Biomedical Engineering, which is one of the top BME programs in China. Again, students who are applying to this program do 30 credits of coursework at Johns Hopkins University, and they also uh, elect a focus area, as do all of our master's students. So now we're going to talk about uh, focus areas and research. And here you see a listing of our focus areas. They are biomedical data science, computational medicine, genomics and systems biology, imaging and medical devices, immunoengineering, neuroengineering, and translational cell and tissue engineering. So biomedical data science is a new, emerging, exciting area of research. It involves understanding how to analyze, manage, and derive knowledge from very, very large data sets. It involves um, uh, aspects of artificial intelligence, particularly machine learning to derive a new understanding from these data sets. Um, it has extensive applications throughout basic science, and it's an emerging area of application in medicine. It holds the potential to reveal methods for predicting what will happen to patients based on uh, continuous real-time streaming data measured from those patients. It holds the possibility of doing a better job at diagnosing patients and, and uh, selecting therapy for uh, patients. And so we have a number of faculty working in this area, and it's becoming an increasingly popular area for our master's students. Computational medicine um, does three things. First of all, we develop uh, computer models of disease. Typically, these are mechanistically based models, but sometimes they're also statistical models, data-driven models. The second thing we do is once equipped with a model of a disease or a disease process or some aspect of disease, uh, we ask the question, how can we measure data from individual patients with which to constrain these models? Is it possible to constrain these models? And once a model has been constrained using data from an individual patient and thereby tuned to the needs of that individual patient, we use models to uh, do a better job at diagnosis and therapy selection. So there are many areas in which we apply computational medicine here at Hopkins. Um, they include in studies of heart disease, brain disease, motor disorders, infectious disease, to name a few. This is a discipline that began at Johns Hopkins University. Genomics and systems biology um, explores uh, the structure of complex, highly interconnected biochemical networks, particularly gene and protein regulatory networks. Uh, it seeks to understand how these network networks function and how they can be controlled and manipulated through um, technologies such as CRISPR, for example. And uh, it sees applications in genomics, epigenomics, and to transcriptomic data sets. 
Immunoengineering seeks to harness the power of the immune system to treat disease and to promote tissue regeneration and healing. It also is an area in which uh, we attempt to develop new uh, engineered materials to modulate immune cell responses. And the goal is to develop new therapies that can be harnessed to do a better job at treating cancer and autoimmune diseases and many other diseases as well. It's a very active area of research at Johns Hopkins University with faculty involved in immunoengineering. There's also an Institute for Cell Engineering in the School of Medicine, which is very heavily involved in this research area. Neuroengineering is um, another focus area. It's a significant and major focus area at Johns Hopkins University. There are over 400 uh, faculty at Johns Hopkins University doing neuroscience and doing neuroengineering. Um, neuroengineering seeks to modulate the nervous system, the central peripheral and autonomic nervous system, um, in order to better understand and treat neurologic disorders. Um, it regulates neural networks at the cellular and subcellular levels to precisely enhance or inhibit function in the body, and it develops new technologies for diagnosis, rehabilitation, repair, and regeneration in the nervous system. Another important aspect of neuroengineering here at Johns Hopkins is neuroinformatics and neurodata. There's a major research thrust in how to uh, interpret and derive knowledge from extremely large-scale, high-resolution imaging data sets and other kinds of large-scale neural data obtained in neuroscience experiments. And we also have a Kavli Neuroscience Discovery Institute here at Hopkins, uh, which is a, uh, a fantastic resource for students interested in working in neuroscience. Translational cell and tissue engineering um, has three major thrusts here at Hopkins. The first is um, the use of stem cells and how to uh, engineer stem cells to differentiate into specific kinds of tissue for tissue regeneration and repair. Second is development of biomaterials that help with reconstruction of injured tissues and organs and guiding and directing cell behavior. And finally is drug and gene delivery uh, nanotechnologies um, that do a better job at delivering uh, genes and drugs to treat diseases such as cancer. Now, uh, a few details about the process of, of of admissions and how we review and consider applications. I think many people see a master's degree as an opportunity to do something new, uh, something new either in their own area of engineering or perhaps it's a transition from one area of engineering into biomedical engineering or an area of basic science into biomedical engineering. Uh, regardless of where you're coming from, I think it's very important that applicants have a solid background in engineering, and that includes coursework in physics, chemistry, math, and biology. In particular, our coursework is very math intensive. So having um, taken uh, integral calculus, differential calculus, multivariable calculus, differential equations, linear algebra, and ideally probability and statistics is very important. We do not filter applications on the basis of GPA. Uh, the number shown here is an average GPA across our applicant pool, and it's typically about 3.7 out of a 4.0. But I think the most important thing in reviewing applications is always the quality of letters from mentors that you've done research with that carries a lot more weight with faculty reviewers than does GPA or GRE score. So the GRE is required uh, unless you're uh, an undergraduate at Hopkins majoring in biomedical engineering, then we don't require the GRE, but ex for external applicants, we do. And here you see average GRE scores, verbal and quantitative across our applicant pool. And for, um, non-English speakers, we require a, a, a TOEFL exam as well. Now, as I said, the most important thing in our review of applications is the quality of letters from mentors with whom you've done research. 
and the way applications are reviewed is that every applicant is asked to pick a focus area and by way of example all of the applicants who choose computational medicine as their focus area uh, those applications will go to a uh, faculty who do research in computational medicine and they'll re be reviewed and and ranked and uh, sent back to me as the director of the master's program and i will make the selections of the top candidates in each focus area based on the number of students that we wish to admit that year and based on our acceptance rate our matriculation rate now uh, to the student experience at hopkins hopkins um, so, so the engineering school is located at the Homewood campus, which is a beautiful campus. It has lovely trees, grass, um, sports fields, quads where students can uh, do activities. Um, it's a safe location. It's a wonderful environment. There are many clubs, many organizations. If you like backpacking, there's something for you here. If you like sea kayaking, there's something for you here. If you like um, Ultimate Frisbee, there's something for you here. There are many different clubs and activities that one can take part in and many different um, graduate student organizations um, that are run by uh, the graduate students um, where you can um, meet people like you. Baltimore is a wonderful city. Uh, it has the feel of a small town, even though it's a fairly large city. It's an extremely foodie city. There are a lot of fantastic restaurants. It's a very active food scene, a very active um, music scene, very active theater scene. It's right on Chesapeake Bay, of course. And a neat thing about Baltimore is you can drive for perhaps 15 to 20 minutes out of Baltimore, pick your direction, and in that 15 or 20 minutes, you're in the country. So um, if you like outdoor activities, they are there in a multiplicity of ways. If you like city, if you like rural, if you like country, it's all there. It's situated on the East Coast, of course. So the commute times to New York and Washington and Philadelphia, Boston are quite reasonable. Amtrak runs the East Coast. So getting around is relatively easily, easy to do. Our BME alumni are everywhere. So some continue to PhD programs and ultimately become a faculty at different institutions, some of which are listed here, including Johns Hopkins University. Some of our master's students continue to medical school. Um, there are multi multiple ways and multiple pathways through the master's program, and many of them, the majority, go into industry. And so we have connections uh, through faculty and connections through the university into many different industries, and we place our students broadly. Um, biomedical engineering students are very much desired in industry because of the breadth of their training in both engineering and biomedicine. Thank you for that so overview. Um, overview, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like, if you have any questions, you can type them. So the I did receive one question in advance, and I will throw this out to you, Ray. And the the student really just wanted some clarity about if you decide if you start in the master's program, but then decide that you want to pursue a PhD. How does that work? So I can I can answer a, that question a little bit um, for that student. The master's program and the PhD programs are completely separate, so you would have to um, apply to the PhD program. It's it's not a clear track to get into the PhD program, but I will email you a link so you can get more information about that. So Joseph is asking for the GRE. Do we have to have our scores back by the December thirty first deadline? No, uh, that's not necessary. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Binyam Bayou asked that question. In terms of the GRE, do we have to have our scores back by the December 31st deadline? No, it's not essential to have them by the 31st. Once you get them, you can, you can submit them. Um, we will begin reviewing completed um, applications as soon as we receive them, and we will do rolling admissions. So it's 
advantageous for you to have your GREs in as, as soon as you can get them. But I would s certainly try and have them by January and February. We'll probably have our decisions made by the end of February. Um, Benji asks, is there much difference in applying to the master's program as a current biomedical engineering student, not the three plus one program? Um, no, there isn't much difference at all, Benji. Um, our policies here are that our biomedical engineering students who have completed four years of training and have a cumulative GPA of 3.3 are auto admitted to our master's program. Um, and so whether you choose to complete the master's degree um, simultaneously, with, simultaneously with the bachelor's degree as part of the three plus one, or whether you uh, plan to do four years as the bachelor's um, for the bachelor's degree, and then apply and matriculate into the master's program, the admissions criteria are, are really the same. You don't need to take the GRE exam as a biomedical as a Hopkins biomedical engineering student, and we auto admit if your threshold if your GR, GPA is three point three or higher. Uh, the question is: I'm very interested in advanced prosthetics. Is it possible to work in the APL while being in the biomedical program? Uh, yes, it is. Your mentors can be uh, in any part of Johns Hopkins University. So your mentors don't uh, necessarily have to be biomedical engineering faculty. You might work with a faculty member in electrical and computer engineering or applied math, or maybe it's a faculty member in the School of Medicine, for example, cardiology or neurology, or for that matter, a faculty member or researcher at the applied physics lab. So yes, you can work and do research at the Applied Physics Lab while in the BME Master's Program. Uh, so Nikoi asks, if I were to choose uh, the two-year program with thesis, can I still take classes during the second year while doing research with the thesis? Uh, that's an issue for you and your mentor, whomever, whomever lab you're working in, they are supporting you. Uh, in that year, and I think that's an issue for you to work out with them because it, it will determine how much time you have to devote to your thesis. But yes, some students do continue to take coursework in their second year. So the question is, am I eligible to apply having a master's in biochemistry and having solid background in physics and math in, uh, in subsequent work? Yes, you're eligible to apply. Um, Whenever I receive an application from a life sciences major, I immediately look at the transcript to determine level of math background. Uh, Benji asked, and is there more applying selection and staying on for a second year thesis? Um, so no. Um, once we admit you to the master's program, um, you can choose to do a one-year course option or a two-year thesis option. For that matter, if you would choose a one-year course option and then subsequently decide that you would like to do a thesis, that's fine. Um, we will allow you to do that. The only issue is you do need to find a mentor to support that thesis work. Uh, and is there much direction in where we obtain it? I'm not quite sure what you're asking there, Benji. Um, it is up to you to choose a focus area, but there are plenty of faculty here who can advise you once you've chosen a focus area um, on other faculty to talk to who do research in that focus area, even outside the biomedical engineering department. So I do that all the time in the focus area of computational medicine. I direct that area. And so many computational medicine master students come to me and ask, who can I possibly work with? And we talk and I give them a list of faculty to contact and they go contact them. And that's how it's done. It works out quite well. That's how you find your mentor. Um, you said, Benji, my current PI wanted me to stay with him and mentioned still working with him for that. That's fantastic. Uh, it's great to come into a master's program already with a mentor. So that's terrific. I meant, okay, you're further uh, clarifying your question, Benji. I meant with which person I mentioned one lab I work with. No. Uh, so in the application and selection process, we do that independent of who you're going to work with. Most students have no idea 
who they're going to work with. So admission is based on quality of the application. Once you're admitted and once you matriculate, um, that's a time to begin thinking about who you want to work with. Uh, the majority of coursework is done in year one. And so during year one, you still have opportunity and time to do research. We give credit for uh, one semester. Uh, so we give three credits, up to three credits per semester in year one towards research, if you so choose. And so there's time to be in a research lab. There's time to be in different research labs. There's time to find a mentor, but that mentor needs to be in place by the end of year one. So that you okay, can do we have any other questions semester. this afternoon? I hope that answers your question. Well, if you do, um, the contact information for Dr. Winslow and also Sam Bourne, who was not on the call today, but is the academic program manager is up on your screen right now, as long as, I mean, I'm sorry, also the department website and the application website.